Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the GeoCoast. Uh, today I'm meeting with the Chief of Staff of the Irish Defence Forces, Vice Admiral Professor Mark Mellet. Hello, Mark. Max, how are you? It's good to see you. Thanks for this opportunity to talk. And um, Mark, I know that for most of your life, uh, before you became the Chief of Staff in the Irish Defence Forces in 2015, you've been serving in the Navy. So what is your personal connection with the sea? Why did you choose this career? But I suppose I came up, I grew up in uh, the west of Ireland in Castlebar, County Mayo. It's only 11 miles from the sea. And I don't think there's any part of Ireland really that is that far from the sea. Although sometimes uh, I don't think we've actually really understood how much an island nation we are. A nation with such a rich maritime heritage and also such a rich maritime jurisdiction. So it was only a matter of, I suppose, a natural course that I applied for the Defence Force at the time and I was uh, offered a cadetship in the Naval Service. Um, I, I think growing up in the west of Ireland, uh, you cannot be but um, taken back by the beauty of your landscape and also the seascape. And there is perhaps, I sense, and maybe I'm biased, nowhere else where that is best reflected in the wonderful coastline of Mayo, from Slyne Head up towards Northwest Mayo, up around towards um, Sligo and Innescroen, but in particular areas like Ackle Island, Clue Bay, um, Golden Sand Beach, but as well as uh, areas like Clare Island and all the islands of Clue Bay itself, and in particular the beautiful Ackle. It's a wonderful coastline running up to Eagle Island, which is um, a beautiful feature off the west coast. Mm -hmm. And do you have any history in your family serving in the military in the army? I, I do in, in the context of the War of Independence uh, and actually the Civil War. Um, two of my uncles, my granduncles, were quite formidable in terms of the, um, the effort at that time. And when I look back at my own institution of Oak Lake Nahirn, uh, you know, the fact that my granduncles were part of that institution that stood up and actually regained our sovereignty back in that lead up to uh, almost 100 years ago when we, we gained our sovereignty. It was probably inevitable was in the blood, but I suppose in terms of my parents, neither were associated with military nor was my grandfather, but my grandmother and her brothers were very much involved in uh, Oak Lake Nahirn uh, and coming them on. Mm -hmm. And can you please describe what would be the main current role of the Irish Navy, Naval Service and how this have evolved from the time when it was founded in 1946? Yeah, well I suppose uh, our primary role in the Defence Forces is to um, be part of the bedrock of this sovereignty of our state. I mean we, we are a capability um, tasked by government with the defence of the state and um, people often say well where is the enemy? Well sovereign rights that are not upheld are more imaginary than real and Ireland is gifted with a massive maritime resource, almost a million square kilometres where we have sovereignty or sovereign rights one of the largest food producing ecosystems and renewable energy environments on the planet. An extraordinary resource whereby we have sovereignty over the sub seabed and uh, resources and we also have the potential in particular on the renewable energy side of a significant opportunity for an offshore wind and I think in also in due course offshore wave whereby we could become if you like the energy hub for Europe. We have a very rich resource in terms of fisheries, which is actually shared with our partners in the context of the EU um, uh, institution, and that's exercised through the common fisheries policy. But I often say, and it's a point of discussion, the fish that swim in our jurisdiction in the first instance are Irish fish. They're actually, uh, uh, they're the sovereign right sits over there from the citizens of the country, and it's not until there's a transfer of the property right of that fish uh, through the institutions of the common fisheries policy do they become the property of somebody else and that's on the basis that they're actually properly uh, I suppose recovered and uh, in, in accordance with that institution of common fisheries policy. Mm -hmm. And um, like the Irish Navy is one of the youngest naval services in the world, yeah? it's set up in 1946. Yes. yes. Yeah? And what was the origin of maritime traditions adopted by the island's naval, naval service? Well, I suppose if we roll back, you know, um, we sometimes forget our heritage. And when I look back, I see three great heroes that were there in terms of St. Brendan, um, who was Brendan the Navigator, who was formidable in the context of his capacity to actually explore the seas. And more recently then, um, we had Grania Whale, the Pirate Queen operating out of my own county, out of Clare Island and a remarkable story of a formidable leader on the maritime who actually understood the maritime 
and actually used the maritime to her own advantage. Um, so much so that actually she, she visited the Queen uh, sailing up the Thames and um, a, a, a remarkable character. And more recently then we had the likes of Admiral William Brown from my own county again, from mm -hmm. Oxford, um, who actually was the founder of the Argentine Navy and a key player in terms of the independence of that state. So looking back at that heritage in terms of our, um, where this state has come from, when the state was formally founded uh, in 1921 and uh, uh, 22, Article 6, I think, of the treaty said, until we had the wherewithal for our own, own coastal defence, that would be provided by His Majesty's uh, armed forces. So, in, to some degree, our state stood up and it was institutionalised in terms of our defence forces with a capability that covered both uh, land and air, but not the maritime. And it wasn't until, I suppose, the lead up to what was called the emergency, but in fact, the Second World War, that I suppose the question began to be asked uh, with regards to formalising a Navy. And that was done in 1946, as you've rightly said. And out of that then, we began to grow our traditions. Naturally speaking, a lot of our traditions were inherited from our nearest neighbour, um, uh, the Royal Navy. And many of us actually had the, the um, the benefit of training with the Royal Navy and we have adopted many of their traditions in our own uh, organisation but the Royal Navy traditions are actually peppered through most navies if you look at it in terms of you know simple things like piping the side, uh, areas with regards to doctrine, very much the Royal Navy would be seen as a leader in the context of the development of maritime operations and it's only natural that you would look at uh, replicating what is good and actually building on and shaping it to your own side. So the Defence Forces, and in particular Naval Service today now, is a, a balanced fleet uh, of nine ships, which is tasked by government with a maritime defence and security operations, upholding our sovereignty, but also being a, an agent to deliver security service to other actors such as Gardaí and uh, Revenue Service of Customs, and also government services departments such as the Sea Fisher Protection Authority and others. Mm -hmm. and what is the history mark around the military ranks in the Irish Navy where the system was adopted? Is it adopted from yeah, the Royal I, Navy? I, yeah, I think most of them are very much the, the they're, they're a, I suppose a hybrid of a Royal Naval ranks but also US Naval ranks I and mean, we have the rank of Ensign which doesn't exist in the Royal Navy but it does exist in the American Navy. Uh, we have uh, our own ranks since then, also that are marrying across in terms of the ranks within the other arms of the Defence Forces in terms of the Army and also the Air Corps. So there's a commonality in terms of the ranks, although we knew, use naval uh, expressions to denote them, there is um, a read across between our Naval Service, our Army and our Air Corps. And another question related to development of kind of maritime traditions would be, what is the history with the naval uniform? Has it changed much since 1946 and where it, was it adopted again the style from the Royal Navy? Or? Yeah, it, it very much is similar to the Royal Navy but a few peculiarities that would be unique uh, to ourselves. We have a bobbin on the actual uh, unlist, enlisted ranks uh, cap in terms of junior enlisted ranks caps. We have the what we call the fore and aft and the square rig. The square rig primarily is what's wor uh, worn by a uh, junior enlisted ranks within the Defence Forces and the square rig is simply similar to what I am, uh, sorry, the, the fore and aft is similar to what I'm wearing at, at present. And, and that is very similar to what is in the Royal Navy in the context of this uniform I wear now. Um, and uh, that has evolved, but it, not very much. Um, there are areas, I suppose, in terms of our working dress that have changed and are changing and now we're about to trial a new um, pattern of material for our uh, personnel, in particular those who would be in, in working rig at sea and ashore, and I'm looking forward to seeing that being introduced as a, on a trial basis, and that will show the evolution. Critically speaking is, um, I think in any organisation, in particular in any military, it's important that uh, the members of that Defence Force actually are proud of their uniform, and you must stay up with the times in terms of evolutions in the uniform itself to make sure that that pride in, in terms of individuals and that a move with times is actually captured in the context of the changes you make. You have already touched base on this um, in one of the previous questions, but I, I'm just wondering if you can think of more examples. So what I wanted to ask is like, are there any maritime traditions associated with the Navy, which would be cutting across borders and jurisdictions? 
Can you think of any traditions that would be respected by all mariners worldwide? Well, I think perhaps the, the most important piece is our, our key enabling marriage, which is people and hard hardware, which is in the ship, the sovereign ship, which is, which is uh, a warship. And people often you know, have suggested that we don't have warships in the uh, Irish Naval Service. Absolutely we do. The institutional requirements of a warship are that, first of all, the ship should be on the state register, and secondly, it must be under the command of an officer who is on the commission list of the forces of that state. So that's a common standing under international law, the Law of the Sea Convention, and it actually is a standard throughout uh, all navies. And the freedoms and the respect given to a warship are such that it actually is held in respect. It's a piece of sovereign territory wherever it travels. And um, as we speak now, one of our ships, the Samuel Beckett, is preparing to actually travel to the United States to represent the interests of government across all the lines in terms of political, mm -hmm. the diplomatic, the economic. And, and that, I suppose, usage of naval assets in that manner is an example whereby it is a common trend in all, uh, I suppose, normal navies. You know, some navies may not have developed it to the extent that perhaps uh, larger navies have, but we're, I think, since 1986 when we first crossed the Atlantic with Eli Etna, where I was uh, privileged to be a member of that ship's company, we have done it more and more. And um, that unique status of a naval vessel is a, a key enabler in terms of those softer sides of diplomacy. Of course, you know, there are other uh, types of operations whereby naval platforms are unique in that they have a freedom of travel almost over 70% of the globe where you don't have to seek permission mm -hmm. because you have the rights of nav freedom of na navigation that, that are... applies to all navies in the world. That applies to all navies and there are obviously um, per certain caveats that come in in terms of the actual influence of a state. But you know, the right of innocent passage is a norm and it's very important that that is upheld and protected so the ships can travel around without interference. Now obviously there, when you come into the, the sovereign space of a state, there are certain obligations with regards to uh, your, your notification if your navigation is not uh, innocent passage through the waters. But uh, that, that is codified in terms of, terms of communications with the state, informing in advance diplomatic notes and, and so on. And what about small things like, for example, ship's bell or the compass would they be cutting across borders as well? Every Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, people, you know, the sophistication in terms of technology is rapidly moving in ships of all types. And there's almost um, very little difference in terms of the types of technology used by naval vessels as well as merchant marine vessels. And one of, that's one of the, um, I suppose, advantages of Ireland's approach to the maritime that we have actually married and aligned our merchant navy with our uh, military navy in a manner of true the, what's happening in the National Maritime College which is a, a joint venture between the Naval Service and Cork Institute of Technology and we then actually have the opportunity to l learn of each other. I remember many years ago in the Naval Service it was like we had two silos, the merchant navy sitting over there, the military navy sitting over here and near, near the twain should meet. But it is such a, a, a development, a positive development, and something that informs an awful lot of what I do now today, the importance of collaboration. And working in silos uh, in today's modern world is suboptimal. It lacks, it undermines efficiency, it undermines effectiveness, and it also undermines trust. And we've learned so much over the decades from the Merchant Navy. And likewise, I think there are some of our practices that have been uh, accepted by the Merchant Navy, so that there is a, a reciprocity in terms of knowledge. And that goes beyond just the maritime side, it also goes between our ability to be part of that triple helix with the Navy uh, on, as one leg of a stool, the research and the higher education institutes as a second leg of a stool, and increasingly linking up with enterprise and uh, maritime related companies that would actually have an interest in, in leveraging new technologies and new ways of doing things. And that's what's happening in terms of our partnerships with University College Cork, uh, Cork Institute of Technology and a plethora of other institutions throughout the state. And also working with um, small and medium enterprises, uh, foreign direct investment uh, companies in some cases, and this, this ability to have the, an outcome that is actually greater than the sum of the parts. And I, and I deviated there back on the whole phrase of collaboration and working together. One, way or, one place where Ireland is to the forefront is certainly the way we've actually got our merchant navy and our military navy working cheek by jowl. 
because it is actually makes us a better state in the context of developing our expertise within the uh, state itself. And you have partly touched base on this as well, like, but so can you think specifically in the context of maritime traditions, which traditions would be cross-cutting cross between military and merchant navy? Yeah. Even I, like we're talking, thinking, tra traditions, I mean, so, so, some things which go back in centuries and which continue. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, some of the bases of how we navigate still remain in terms of boats. We, we, we all, uh, we can become obsessed with technology, but there are some fundamentals. I mean, we don't know when GPS might be switched off, mm. and that could happen at any time. We don't know when there could be other means to actually interfere with your radio navigation aids. So the critical importance and at, at the center of all our learning are some fundamentals with regards to basic coastal navigation, basic astro navigation, being able to find your position in terms of using the stars and the planets. It's quite a mm -hmm. sophisticated uh, exercise, quite, um, a challenging uh, mathematical calculation, but you can do that and you can actually fix your position with relative accuracy from the stars, uh, in particular at that critical moment uh, when you can see the horizon and still see the stars. And, and likewise, skippers, uh, the captains of, of the ship still being trained in this? Scale? Oh, absolutely. And navigators are trained all the time. And uh, likewise, in terms of one of the um, the uh, best means of uh, acquiring your, your latitude is actually uh, taking the elevation of the sun at midday and that will bring you to uh, where you are on a latitude and then uh, a number of fixes before and after that will give you a relative position where you are at a particular position in the world. So the use of actually traditional means still is core to our development within the Naval Service and it's built on that premise that you don't know what resources will be to, available to you. And the other piece too which would be very much I suppose a common to both services is the actual fundamental importance of the Mark I eyeball. You know, increasingly I, I see, um, I suppose, events which happen in terms of near misses or actually collisions are events that occur between both military and merchant navy where the, the missing piece was the human element whereby there was an over-reliance on technology and a failure to actually look out the window, the bridge window of the ship and see actually what's happening in front of your face. And I can think of a number of quite tragic outcomes in, in recent years where the, the key element that was actually not upheld was the lookout reporting properly in terms of what was happening in the space around us using your eyes. Can you think of any such examples that happened in Irish waters? Can you give these examples? I can recall examples in Irish waters. I, I, I have to be careful. It's not a huge community that we're talking to and I have to be careful not to point a finger in a particular direction because I think people will be very quickly able to um, calculate what incident I, I am talking about. But I do recall um, quite formidable ships tra traveling at high speed through thick fog and not being uh, aware of actually where they were relative to the coast and having very near misses in the context of um, not perhaps uh, being as alert as they should be to some fundamentals. And uh, that can happen, you know, where you get a level of comfort uh, your technology is, uh, your autopilot's on, your, your uh, technology is there, but uh, you must also, besides looking out the window, you must also look at your radar from time to time because your radar will show you um, where the coastline is and also a, another, I suppose, key instrument is your uh, echo sounder to see in which water is below the keel because it is um, an embarrassing position to end up with insufficient like, yeah. uh, water under your keel. And um, I could tell you some stories about uh, events myself. I remember once anchoring quite close in a challenging anchorage and um, the weather suddenly changing and for um, a, a very challenging uh, half an hour or so we were dragging towards a, a, a very challenging shoreline. Fortunately uh, I had a great, great crew. We were able to recover our anchors, get the engine started and move out of that dangerous position uh, to a safer anchorage. Um, but it just taught me a lesson in terms you can never uh, take things for granted and uh, perhaps that's the biggest um, risk to anybody who's involved in a business such as ours is becoming complacent. You must always be alert, you must also always be sensitive to your responsibilities whether it's in command or your predictor function whether you're a watchkeeper or in the engine room of your responsibility to ensure that your part and your contribution to the team uh, ensures the safety of your um, shipmates, but uh, also the safety of the ship itself. And that goes for the military navy as it goes for the merchant navy. And 
there's an added complication with that. It, by its nature, military navies often have to go into challenging environments whereby the pressures are more than just the uh, geophysical nature of the space you're operating and that you may have an enemy who is endeavouring to inflict damage on you with um, a fire and you have to be prepared to deal with that. Uh, and also there is the reality that you sometimes have to be prepared to be offensive in terms of your ability to inflict uh, pressure on others, in particular if you're dealing with a, a, a terrorist or a gun running scenario or a situation whereby you're uh, endeavouring to intercept uh, narcotics uh, or, or, or something along that line. Um, of course, you know, in more recent years we've had very challenging operations in terms of the Mediterranean whereby we bring our capability to bear in the context of the um, attempt to undermine the criminality associated with people smuggling and people trafficking, which is one of the biggest tragedies uh, I, I, in recent years as it, that has been happening in the context of the, uh, I suppose, the migration patterns uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. And there is a misery associated with uh, criminals and networks exploiting the uh, challenging circumstances that people who are forced out for a variety of reasons to try and cross uh, challenging seas like the Mediterranean. And uh, we have been there, we've been uh, endeavouring as part of the European missions Operation SOFIA and before that in terms of bilateral with uh, Italy delivering services. Uh, and, and while there was um, a, a risk and a threat in terms of other actors, the overwhelming challenge on that period was to deal with the massive numbers we had to in terms of saving lives and we we have saved uh, in as a defense forces over 18,000 or around 18,000 people we we have tragically in the, Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean just in the last few years yeah and tragically we've seen hundreds of people uh, drown mm. we've recovered many bodies and um, it is for because the indicators uh, are not going to change in the short term we've got two pressures in terms of uh, I suppose Africa as a continent in particular it's one of the continents most impacted by climate change. Climate change that actually is impacting on the level of resources available to that continent. And while at the same time, Africa is actually experiencing an extraordinary, um, ex I suppose, development in terms of population. And it's, it, UN forecasts that uh, the African continent's population will almost double by 2050. And these operations in the Mediterranean Sea that you mentioned, were they carried out um, in collaboration with other naval services? Yeah, we worked. Uh, and, yeah, we worked primarily with the Italians in terms of the first bilateral in Operation Pontus, and more recently then with the um, EU institutions in terms of Operation Sophia, which was um, um, an, an EU-led mission. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the actual efforts of the men and women of the Defence Forces came down to basic skills, the ability, and it's something that it would, I suppose, separate us from other navies, is our ability to operate in very challenging environments in small boats that are launched and recovered from ships. And that was a key enabler in terms of that type of operation in the Mediterranean. Um, we obviously are, are, have to intercept whereby we see uh, people who are in a difficult circumstance and they're often we, when we arrived on the scene they were already in the water the craft had sunk mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they were so overloaded the craft was about to sink and the difficulty with then the, the challenges in terms of criminality is if we carried out the rescue uh, and left the craft it was often uh, used by the criminals to go back in and use it as again, a platform yeah. do it again so we developed particular skills to dispose of those crafts so they couldn't be utilised in terms were they of... Sunk? Uh, they were sunk, generally sunk. Um, but, you know, going back to that kind of expertise, uh, and generally the Mediterranean is, um, uh, I, I suppose, a, more, more, a less hostile environment than we find off the west coast. Over the decades, we have refined the skills of launching and recovering boats in what are statistically some of the roughest seas in the world. I think the largest wave ever measured by a scientific instrument was off the northwest coast of Ireland, almost, uh, I think it was in excess of 29 metres. Mm -hmm. And that can be the conditions that our ships operate in. And when I look at our ships, you must think of the people on the ships. That's the environment in which very often we have to deliver services uh, from. An environment which, while it is a million square kilometres, it is statistically some of the roughest seas uh, on the planet. And we have to actually ensure that the, our personnel are properly trained, that our ships are well found, and that we actually have the ability to forecast properly these evolving situations at sea. In particular, uh, as we see now, 
the consequence of climate change that is in leading to what I see is um, a deterioration in terms of the North Atlantic um, storm patterns that we have to and characterise our, our, um, our operating environment. And I know now you're in charge of the, you're the chief of staff of the Irish Defence Forces, so you're in charge of the whole army. But before 2015, for a few years, you worked as a flag officer yes. on the naval base. And here we're standing on the top point of the naval base, overlooking the beautiful Cork Harbour. And I was just curious, could you elaborate maybe on what are the main day-to-day -day duties of a flag officer? Yeah, in, in, well, in the naval service is basically delivering the maritime element of defence in keeping with government policy. And that would be, first of all, the actual uh, capacity to meet the defence, the, the security, and the government service requirements in the maritime domain primarily. And that, you know, re really boils down to um, developing a strategy that actually matches the policy of government. In, in, in real terms, that translates back into looking at the people in your organisation, ensuring that they're properly developed and they're married with that key enabler, which is the ship, and that they can do so in a manner whereby their training uh, ensures that they are able to maximise the outputs of that ship in terms of defence or a security or a government service side. Critically important, however, is creating that environment of an esprit de corps where people are valued, where they have a sense of camaraderie, where the actual organisation itself offers as an opportunity for people to develop in the organisation itself. And we do that. And, and Naval Service personnel are highly sought after at a time where we have a buoyant uh, economy. Uh, I see again and again where uh, highly developed skills uh, are going to other parts of the private and public sector. And it's, at times it can be a frustration in the investment, but you know, at the same time, I see these skills being reinvested back into civil society, whether it be into the enterprise or other parts of the public sector. And it's part of the cycle of a, an organisation, is trying to manage that balance that your, your premature voluntary retirements, as I call them, they're not leaving too early. Uh, and at times I, I have to advocate in terms of ensuring that conditions are right within the naval service so that we actually can make it incentivize retention measures. And right now I'm in that space at the moment, advocating in terms of uh, improving the incentives to stay in the organization, mm -hmm. improving so the incentives. Keep the expertise in-house. Yeah. Keep the expertise in-house uh, so that we, we individuals feel that there is a career for them in the naval service itself. And likewise in terms of ensuring that we are attractive to new entrants in terms of competing with other parts of the market from the point of view of a career in the Defence Forces and, and that just doesn't apply to the Naval Service, it applies to the Army and applies to the Air Corps. One thing I would say, I will never apologise for advocating for the men and women of the Defence Forces, whether they be in the Air Corps or whether they be in the Army or whether they be in the Naval Service. That's my job. It's my job in terms of a leader to create the conditions that are um, optimised to ensure that we have a healthy organisation where people, people feel valued, where risk is managed properly and we deliver a level of service that is uh, appropriate to the demands of government, whether it be in the defence uh, security or in the government support services. Mm -hmm. And Mark, what would be the current challenges that are facing the Irish Naval Service? I think there, there, it's, it's currently known that we, we are having challenges in terms of the retention of our personnel at present. It's such an attractive market outside, a buoyant economy that is actually uh, leveraging on the highly skilled uh, individuals. And you know, not only are we, we're, we're, we're having a double tap here because I was just talking to a flag officer this morning, you know, we are losing good people to um, very lucrative uh, employment, in particular around this area here where you have a lot of the pharma, which would be tech heavy. You have a lot of um, industries uh, that would be after the types of skills we have. And that, that, that is a big challenge. And I suppose the other challenge I see is often when we try and uh, recruit, uh, and in particular when we try and take, let's say, direct entry skill levels, we've seen again and again, as soon as we actually make the offer, the employer actually ups his offer to retain the individual and that's the freedom that I don't have in the context of being able to compete with that. So um, we're, we're looking at ways in which we can first of all improve our offering in terms of recruitment but the critical piece is to actually try and husband and value those who are serving in the organisation, make it attractive for them to stay in the organisation and in particular make it attractive for them to go to sea. Going to sea is a challenging, uh, I suppose, job at the best of times and I'm very conscious in terms of people who serve in the Defence Forces, no matter what service is, they serve there with the support base of their families. So we have to be conscious increasingly of the societal and the domestic 
pressures that individuals, whether they're man or woman, feel in the context of their service to defence forces. And I keep on now looking beyond the individual and I'm looking at his support base and that's an area we're trying to develop is our, our support services to families because it is they who often are the silent partner in the context of the service provision to the state and the loyalty of the soldier, the sailor or the aircrew member is critical but I, I actually want to acknowledge the loyalty of families who often make sacrifices when their, their husband or their wife or their daughter um, or their mother is actually, uh, or their father is overseas or actually at sea or separated for extended periods because they're serving their state so loyally and keeping with our values. And another question I wanted to ask you is um, myself, like I was involved for many years in mapping the seabed. Yes. Yeah? Um, so creating three-dimensional bathymetrical maps yeah, of the yeah, seabed yeah. mapping, seabed type. So I just wanted to ask you, like, what's the relevance of seabed mapping for naval operations? Does Navy need bathymetrical multi-beam maps produced, for example, by the Informa program, you know, three-dimensional bathymetrical maps, or it's of little value? Well, I'm not going to say it's a little value because that, <laughs> that would mean you've been wasting your time. It's absolutely essential. I mean, we look around here and we see the landscape around us. We can see the three dimensions in terms of what we see in terms of forests, in terms of farmland, in terms of quarries, in terms of even the, the built infrastructure. Imagine if you couldn't see that. Imagine how boring it would look if you could not differentiate between what you see on a beautiful day like today. And what work you have done and the Irish National Seabed Survey has done is actually transform the actual, I suppose, what we can't see into a wonderful world of canyons and mountains and uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems. You know, people don't realize the richness of our biodiversity, in particular on the maritime side. I, I my own area of research and, uh, is looking at extraordinary, beautiful deep water corals, which are as rich as the, um, the corals of Australia. And you know, they're sitting off our coast all along the Atlantic break from north to south, wonderful, vulnerable marine ecosystems which are the engine to the productivity in terms of the fisheries that are there and there was a while where we didn't value that and I asked that question who owns biodiversity well we own biodiversity the citizens own biodiversity so we must always build it into our calculations when we're uh, um, when policy is evolving to ensure that there aren't unnecessary externalities in terms of activities we have for instance you know we've had uh, occasions where uh, I've witnessed um, the aftermath of a uh, deep water trawling that in 30 seconds can destroy a cold water coral reef that took 8,000 years to form and that can happen so we, we need to look at the externalities of actions we take and the beauty about the uh, National Seabed Survey and the beauty about the geocasting work that you are doing that mapping these vulnerable areas is actually giving us knowledge and giving us better inputs to planning so that we can actually start protecting these areas to special areas of conservation because it is not just you know from the point of view of being for today it is actually part of the engine of the ecosystem and increasingly we're going to have to look at ourselves as not managers of the ecosystem but partners in the ecosystem you know there, there is not a position whereby we should for a moment assume that we are going to manage the ecosystem in a manner that actually uh, suits uh, humanity. We as an actor and our anthropogenic activity is something that actually has to be settled within an ecosystem that has become stabilized. We're going to have to look at the sustainability of the actions we take and there's no better framework than the sustainable development goals that set that high arch level arching uh, architecture for us to actually for our activities and, and they will place demands on it and that will mean it will limit some of our actions and it will also mean that we need to take a longer time frame in terms of decisions we're making, in particular on the environment. I often think that we need to be thinking in decades, 80 to 100 years, if we're to get the proper understanding of the impacts of decisions we make today. And that, that is a big requirement, especially when you look at often the political cycle is off, often just around five years. So I do see uh, things are changing. The issue with regards to the reality of climate change being here and now and the penalties associated with that are forcing us to actually to be uh, more strategic in decisions we make 
in the context of the environment. But as you touch base about climate, as you mentioned climate change, and I actually wanted to ask you later on about this, uh, but we might as well talk, talk about this now. Um, I know we hear a lot on the news about climate change. Imagine if there was no news about this, yeah? Yes. And you had to make conclusions just based on your own personal observations. You, like somebody who's been out at sea for about 40 years, yeah? Have you noticed in this period of time any changes in sea conditions or in weather conditions linked to particular seasons? Or can you say that the sea has always been full of surprises? Yeah. This doesn't change. Well, one thing for sure, the sea is always full of surprises and it's one uh, environment you never take for granted. But yes, you know, I, I think the, um, the occurrence of uh, North Atlantic storms along the track, primarily uh, from the Caribbean up towards um, Northwest Europe is there and the evidence is there of an increase in um, the, the numbers each year and also an increase in the ferocity. So there, there is that change in the context of the maritime, uh, but also there is a change in the context of other impacts with regards to anthropogenic uh, or the activity of man. Uh, and that's the issue of plastics and waste at sea. You know, it's not a question that fishers are throwing the plastic in the sea. It's coming from us all, you know, because of carelessness in terms of allowing runoff, you know, into our rivers, into our rivers that actually eventually end up in the sea and eventually it ends up in polluting, it ends up interfering with um, uh, resources, it ends up uh, actually uh, also adding to the chaos that is growing in the maritime. The other piece that is there in, in the context is this rise in acidity in the oceans because of the amount of carbon that is in the air the oceans is one of the biggest absorbers of carbon dioxide and the penalty for that is the ocean is becoming more acidic and that the implications of that are something that many scientists are looking at but there are worrying indicators as to the impact of increased acidity in the ocean in the context of uh, fisheries of course the temperature side is changing as well and that's uh, leading to a rise in sea temperature which is changing migratory patterns in terms of fisheries that traditionally may well have um, operated or been around our coast. It also is bringing new types of fisheries uh, to our area as we see now uh, some pelagics that actually um, are moving further north uh, that would not have been traditionally in our area. So there are lots of impacts in the context of uh, the impact of climate change, not just in the context of the, the, uh, the visible, but also in terms of the overall stability and the, the balance of the ecosystem. But from your personal observations, basically, you, you, you can say that you noticed the increase in storminess. Eh? In yes, the well, days, I, eh? I, I have. I, obvious, I, eh? Well, I, I won't say it's obvious, it would be dangerous because I'm not a meteorologist. Mm. But I, I will uh, say that I, I know from my own research in terms of looking at the occasions and the number of um, a greater than gale, force 8 is a gale, mm -hmm. the number of events that would have a force 8 or greater. The, the, those events are increasing statistically. So the frequency of, events uh, frequency long, of, yeah. of greater than gales and the frequency of storms is increasing. So that, that is a, an indicator um, in terms of a change. And also then the energy associated with those is, is a change. And we, 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 we just need to look back at Ophelia, which was quite a challenging uh, storm that hit us uh, um, in, in the recent past. And it, you can see then the power. And could you imagine if you were at sea as that approached? Mm and the ferocity of that. A few minutes ago, uh, um, you mentioned deep water corals. And, yes. And myself, I spent like over five years mapping deep water corals to the west of Ireland and wrote a PhD thesis about them. So I know this in great detail. And actually, I would be very interested to know, as you've been out at sea for years, like probably you started going to sea before I was born. Yeah, <laughs> um, long time before you were born. <laughs> well, 1978? Yeah, long time. Oh, yeah, I was at sea before that. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, well, that's right. Eh? Yeah. So, I wanted to ask you, like, do, can you recall when you became aware that there are corals to the west of yeah. Ireland? When, when, when you actually found out about them? I remember, well, I remember as a young officer in the Navy and uh, boarding uh, trawlers off the west coast, and uh, they were fishing on an area known as the Coral Ground. And, you know, I remember often inspecting the catch that would land on the deck and in the, amongst the catch of the fish, the beautiful hake, um, you would find pieces of broken coral. And uh, 
you know, I, I, I suppose I didn't think much about it. But like you, since then, I've done my PhD in cold water corals and uh, the vulnerability of vulnerable marine ecosystems. Yeah. Coral is a remarkable, um, I suppose, uh, it, it's a remarkable ecosystem in terms of it's got both living and dead structure to it. And that poses a question, you know, in terms of the actual law, you know, because what are you protecting? Do you, are you protecting the living element of the coral yeah. or are you protecting the actual dead element of the coral or do you protect both? And actually you have to protect both because it doesn't survive unless both elements are there. But, you know, the challenges, as you probably know, in terms of cold water corals and also in terms of shallow water corals are, you know, actually increasing largely uh, because of anthropogenic activity the impact of acidity in the ocean, but also in terms of shallower corals, the actual pressures from uh, uh, bleaching from, uh, the, uh, from, from this increase in terms of temperature, and that, that's, that is a challenge. But I suppose the, the other piece with regards to corals, as you're probably well aware, they don't sit in the terms of an ecosystem on their own. There are other uh, actors there, and one of the tragedies that uh, I looked into uh, at length was the actual um, the orange roughy species, which uh, very often was associated with uh, cold water corals and sea mounts. And uh, you're probably aware of this. Uh, we developed a fishery in this state back in uh, towards the end of the 90s and early 2000s, whereby uh, the orange roughy was uh, was was part of the uh, non-quota species initially, and subsequently was a quota species. But um, it was effectively wiped out in, in a very short period because uh, people probably don't understand this about orange roughy. Uh, orange roughy, in terms of a lifespan, is actually can live to over 200 years. Mm. Some of the fish being caught were actually alive when Darwin was on the Beagle, um, reflecting on the evolution of mankind. The fish were swimming when Darwin was on the Beagle reflecting on the evolution of mankind. It's extraordinary that you would land a fish on a table and eat it today. So that's not a sustainable fishery, it never was a sustainable fisheries. And in fact, it was a perversity that fish that could live to that age were effectively in mind, and they have been mined to an extent whereby uh, I think uh, the evidence of uh, orange roughy off the west coast is, is very, very slim now. And I think they're, they're actually largely, um, um, they've been fished out because they were not sustainable. An orange roughy fish doesn't become sexual active until it's about 30 years of age, which um, is, is remarkable. So it's just, um, I suppose, going back to the issue of, of uh, acquiring knowledge and understanding with regards to um, our environment, and in particular, in our case, let's say the maritime. When you acquire that knowledge, uh, it can't sit on its own in the context of, oh, I know this now. It needs to be contextualized into a framework that actually leads to proper governance to ensure resources like that. I often say knowledge without values leads to unilateralism, populism, and often selfishness. Knowledge with values leads to multilateralism and wisdom. And you need wise thinking to actually deal with um, resources like that in the context of a, a resource that, you know, if you apply, if you don't apply values to it in terms of proper uh, measures to protect that resource, you lose it. And I've seen in my lifetime that fisheries has disappeared off the west coast of Ireland uh, because we weren't applying wisdom. The knowledge we applied was where was it, mm -hmm. and uh, it was acquired. But we should have stepped back and said, Let, let's put an understanding of values around that. And values, I would say, are linked to sustainability towards a best application of science, towards the actual responsibilities of future generations. And, and they were not applied, so that uh, we've now led, ended up with the, the shortcoming of a, a resource that was there that is no longer with us. And in addition, much of the cold water corals associated with that fisheries were destroyed as well. Mark. I I know that you were the second naval officer in the history of the Irish state to be awarded the Distinguished Service Medal by the Irish government for your role in the anti-drug maritime operations. Um, can you please tell me what were these operations about and what were the most challenging moments, as I guess you had to work in very high seas at the time? Yeah. 
Well, I, I should mention my colleague, Captain Jim Robinson, who was the first recipient, uh, officer recipient of a Distinguished Service Medal for his actions in the context of that tragic um, loss of uh, Dear India flight off the southwest coast. And Jim was one of the first uh, operators on scene at the time and uh, had to go through the very challenging task of recovering many bodies uh, in, in very challenging environment where there was slight... But, um, I had the privilege to be uh, awarded by government uh, the Distinguished Service Medal for the interception of the BRIME operation. But, you know, my, my uh, and I, I'm looking at um, some of our boarding parties training down the harbour as we speak, um, because at the end of the day, it wasn't I who actually secured the BRIME, it was my team led by Lieutenant Declan Fleming uh, and a boarding crew that actually did remarkable uh, work. It was a challenging operation. I remember the night it happened. It was um, into the, the 12th of July, 13th of July uh, in 1993. And um, it was a difficult operation because we had to uh, find that vessel under darkness. It's very hard to hide a ship when uh, you're trying to come up on an individual that you believe is involved mm -hmm. in subversive activity. And we did it successfully. The boarding crew did a remarkable job. The ship's company, in terms of navigators, did a remarkable job. I recall traveling at nearly 50 kilometers an hour uh, through the Blasket Sound because we had to get there before dawn. And the, the rigor and discipline required in terms of your command team on a ship that is uh, near a thousand tons uh, is very, very demanding. There is no room for error. And uh, the team successfully managed to uh, attain their interception without notifying the um, vessel that we were in the area and then we did a standoff boarding which meant we send our team from distance and um, before the, um, in, the, the in the ribs yeah before the, the rigid inflatable boats before the actual smugglers knew it our uh, personnel were approaching and now that's not to say they didn't try to react but uh, i think the training of our uh, boarding party was such that they quickly overran the uh, vessel and gathered valuable intelligence that was subsequently of value in other cases, but in particular uh, two tons of narcotics. Um, while the yacht began to sink because what they had managed to do was open up a sea chest and allow water flow in, but such was the speed and such was the ma makeup of the boarding team that they managed to secure that uh, sea chest, stop the water coming in, secure all the evidence, secure the actual smugglers, Dutch, Belgian, British and Irish and a successful prosecution followed on. Were they armed? There was a, a weapon on board, uh, but they, there wasn't a violence offered in the, con in the form of arms, but there was an attempt to um, overrun the boarding party. And uh, that was uh, one of the challenges, it was to successfully board the vessel without being struck by the 26 tonne vessel as it was, vis-a-vis uh, -vis our rubber uh, rigid inflatable boats that we were trying to, to, to board from. Were there other operations or you can't talk about them? Well, there's always operations uh, there and some I can talk about and some I, I don't. But I remember, you know, as a, a, a young officer involved in uh, operations related to, you know, large um, super tankers that were in difficulty, uh, Betelgeuse, um, it was a tragedy then that actually occurred in terms of an explosion that led to the loss of uh, around 50 lives in Bantry. And we, we all uh, tragically remember that um, that event, it was uh, shortly after I joined the Navy and we, we had to um, support the operation initially with our divers uh, and then subsequently with the um, disposal of the Hulk that was left there at the time. There are operations in terms of, uh, which are openly known in terms of our interception of armed smuggling in Rita Ann uh, and others. There were operations and there are operations in terms of quite significant interceptions of narcotics that were bigger than I was involved in and very successfully uh, executed uh, on, I, I think of some under the supervision of my former colleague uh, Commander Eugene Ryan who was uh, head of operations at the time and um, Lieutenant Commander Martin Bresh who was the captain of ship in one significant in interception and, and, and more and I, you know it wouldn't be fair for me to list them all because I'm going to get in trouble with, with some of my colleagues because I didn't mention this operation or that operation but it is a constant challenge in terms of actually trying to provide uh, the, the, the security 
capabilities for a, a domain that is almost a million square kilometres where we have sovereign rights. And we don't do this in isolation. We work with partners in terms of Angardi, with the Customs and Revenue. We also work with international partners in terms of our neighbouring states. Uh, there is a phrase that um, we use in Irish, in the article Curlicale, and it goes back to my earlier point. There is no strength without unity. So it is really in the context of the maritime, I suppose more than anywhere else, that multilateral approaches are the requirement in terms of being successful mm -hmm. because of the complexity that characterizes that environment. And cooperation and that, between different with, agencies. With different agencies. And that, that means, you know, surrendering egos, you know, because uh, I think Einstein said it, ego equals one over knowledge. So the more you know, the smaller your ego should mm -hmm. be. And uh, I, if I've learned one thing over the decades, the biggest impediment to collaboration is ego. So we need to actually a create a pill that actually gets rid of egos and do you know what that pill is actually is called knowledge and the more people learn the more we actually can get a sense of interdependency and actually mutual support uh, and that's the way the world should be in the context of this explosion of knowledge we have that increasingly the answers to our challenging problems actually lie outside our organisation and boundaries but if we have a reciprocity and an understanding through collaborative efforts that actually allows us to share new knowledge we acquire, there will come that point where the answer to your challenge and problem will be within the remit of your partner. And if you have invested in building those collaborative networks, then you will get the answer quickly enough to actually make an effect that mitigates the, that, that problem you're dealing with. And thinking about, uh, talking about statistics, um, if we talk about like drug smuggling and other criminal activities in Irish waters, do you think Irish waters became safer, let's say, over the last 30, 40 years? Are they safer now than 30 years ago? Yeah, well, I, I can refer to the, to the testimony in terms of the, the um, criminals at the time of the Brime operation. This isn't my, this is a, actually a statement of fact that the belief amongst the smugglers that uh, the Irish coast was wide open. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was chosen to actually endeavour to smuggle uh, drugs into Ireland at that particular time. Certainly our capabilities have improved significantly since then. The government has ex in invested uh, significantly, and in particular the, the newer Beckett class of ship, uh, which we have here now. And, uh, you know, and there is plans to invest further. So are we perfect? No, we're not. Do we have better capability? Yes, we have. And is the collaboration improved? Yes, it is. We have Mayoc in, which is Maritime Analysis and Operations Centre, Narcotics in Lisbon. And that, that has been quite successful in terms of helping us to actually drive that collaboration between states. And also we have growth in uh, improvements in technology in terms of systems, in terms of other domains such as fisheries, vessel monitoring systems that actually allow you to have a better a technology picture in terms of what's happening around you. But of course all of these are continually being challenged by the criminals who want to exploit uh, the seams and actually ensure their own activities can go on. So you develop a new technology and very quickly a criminal will be looking at a workaround for it. But that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a reality and that's the nature of the world in, in the context of uh, so what happens. So it's a constant challenge of kind of controlling the situation, like if you can't say that the waters became safer, you're just like, it's becoming more challenging. To it, it, it is, complexity yeah. grows, but there is, a, 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 we're always, it is always a battle in the context of endeavouring to actually have appropriate institutions applied in our maritime domain. And, you know, what has happened also nationally has been a much greater awareness in the context of the value of our maritime. And I, and I must commend uh, the Marine Institute in this regard in terms of how they have actually, you know, acted as a portal into the marine. And, you know, research institutes like your own, how you have actually brought this knowledge forward so that we actually can all have a greater understanding of the importance of protecting our marine. So there's an environmental piece to it, there is a, a law enforcement piece to it and there is also a technology piece to it and, and they're all uh, critical but most of all the underpinning piece is, is a learning piece and you know trying to ensure that children in schools have a greater appreciation in terms of maritime heritage, but also the value of our maritime and the critical importance of the maritime as a key regulating sphere in terms of our climate. That, that is vitally important because we can look at times in terms of the climate change and the, how we're going to rectify or try and arrest the speed at the change of climate. Uh, and we look at it from the point of view of the environment immediately around us, but a key environment that we need to look at in the context of the importance of regulating uh, climate change is the maritime. It is so important, it is uh, as important if not more important than rainforests uh, and that's the simple 
matter of fact. Can I just check the camera? Yes. Yeah. And just to add on to, you know, one, one of the, I suppose, additional points I would say in relation to the efforts, increasingly in the Defence Force, and this is something that, um, which uh, my Minister, I've been trying to drive, is the jointness between our services, because, you know, it's not just a naval dimension, there's an air dimension, and the, the technology is with the, our Air Corps at present in terms of the maritime surveillance aircraft, and there's a pr program in place mm -hmm. at present to acquire new technology and new platforms that will even enhance further our maritime air surveillance capacity. It's the marriage between the services, so we're looking at the effect we achieve rather than who delivers that. Mm -hmm. And talking about traditions, Mark, I guess um, a very new thing would be the role of social media in our lives. Yeah. And I know that even you as a chief of staff, you have a Twitter and Instagram accounts. Yes. And I'm just curious, like, was it your own initiative to set it up or is it official requirement for all state officials to have? No, it was uh, certainly my Twitter account was my more recently, uh, you'll see, I've, I'm trying to set up an Instagram, but I, I have to keep on going to my children to say, uh, how does this work? Because I just, I tweet and then I try and load it over onto the Instagram. And I know there's a link between the two and I can't get it to work at present. but. I suppose when I became Chief of Staff, I saw that increasingly Twitter is being used as a means of getting a message out or, you know, explaining something that's happening. So it's, for me, it's a contemporaneous record of my diary, what I do each day. And I think the transparency in terms of the Office of Chief of Staff deserves uh, that justice to uh, the citizens for which I deliver services and, and the government official, officials to, to whom I answer. So Twitter allows me to actually uh, have that contemporaneous record, but it also uh, gives me an opportunity to articulate some of the items that I see important. And some of the items are around uh, the values system that we've actually uh, recently had the award of Uktaran Nehirn, uh, who awarded our values champions uh, with the prize for the Chief of Staff's Values Champions Award um, in the last few days. And that's uh, important and they're related to the co collaboration side, the importance of diversity, empowerment of women, getting gender balance in the Defence Force. And I, I, I can message that. Like, the Defence Forces is a remarkable career for any man or woman. Uh, the, one of the challenges I face, however, is that 93% of the organisation are male and I, I need to increase the number of women. For the very reason you know, I was saying earlier on, that it's important to have different perspectives informing challenging problems. And if you have a predominantly male-dominated organisation, you're missing a critical perspective in terms of the female brain, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. So it's not just about political correctness in terms of Defence Forces, and I use Twitter to articulate this. It's not just about being a better reflection of the society we defend, protect and serve. It's not just about getting access to 50% of the population in terms of recruitment. It's a capability issue. And I am quite exercised that I'm, I'm not able to make progress in terms of getting more women into the organisation at the level we need. And likewise, seeming to operate the career opportunity that, that retains women at the level we would like. Mm. But I guess here you're fighting against the tradition which goes back in centuries when it was the job of a man to go at war. Yeah? yeah, well, you're right, and that's that's correct. But I think things have changed. We've become a lot more sophisticated. We're now a civilized society. We, we, we've seen importance. I think there's a very interesting statistic. If you take the gender gap in this, uh, which is, uh, I think, um, captured by the UN, and you look at the defaulters in terms of where the gender gap is greatest, those states where the gender gap is greatest, that's where intrastate and interstate violence is greatest. So there's a, there is a marriage there between areas whereby the sophistication of the institutions of civil society are less developed actually translates into violence and we need to actually be aware of that in the context of the uh, levers we try to apply to actually restore the institutions of civil society and that, that's why I think it's very important that the force we would apply in terms of our defence forces has that institutionalised gender perspective. It's not just about pushing forward uh, more women, it's pushing forward a perspective in the capacity of our force that goes forward that understands the importance of empowerment of women, of gender equality in terms of the actual, often the absence of it being a driver of violence and a driver of insecurity. But like getting back to the subject of social media, I find it fascinating that um, this development in, in traditions, if you like, in tradition of sharing information, because like 40 years ago, everything to do with the army was secret. Yeah. Was like 
you, you wouldn't be talking about it publicly, but now you're actually sharing your day-to-day -day life with the public and myself, like I'm with interest following your Twitter and Instagram accounts and some of the photos, they're quite interesting and informative. Yeah, and well, I it, think it kind of stimulates people yeah. to think about. Well, there was a paper. As well. Yeah, I, I, in the recent past, I mean, it's probably maybe um, a decade ago, the Wise Pens, which were um, a, a retired group of admirals who, who, who reflected on the whole issue of the importance of data uh, sharing and the importance of information. And their conclusion was: we've moved beyond the need to know to the need to share. And that's on the basis that if we don't share, and going back to my point in terms of knowledge, you know, if you, the, the knowledge has a half-life now that it actually is reducing all the time because new knowledge is coming along. So if you don't leverage the knowledge you have, it's going to be overtaken by a new set of knowledge. But if your antenna are not up in terms of harvesting what is being created, in terms of new technologies or new ways of doing things or new processes or new systems, you'll be locked in, a, I suppose, a traditional mindset that will mean that you're actually not fit for purpose. Three things are clear to me. If we don't leverage knowledge that are available to us, we increase risk. If our enemy leverages knowledge that are available to them, they become more formidable. And the simple reality, information is exploding so much. New technologies and new knowledge has been created at such a pace that every moment there are new ways to do things. So what I'm trying to do within the organization is build into the mindset that when you start your, your process or your work within, take a moment for every day to say, is there a new technology or is there a new way of doing what I'm about to do? And no better person than the person who is actually doing stuff to actually be asking that question. I mean, researchers can develop the new technologies and, and the new processes, but likewise, there has to be a bottom up in terms of a demand for new ways of doing things. And that's, that's where we need to be as in terms of sophistication. Talking about traditions, uh, there is one uh, tradition that I, I uh, with the support of my minister at the time, Minister Shatter, did uh, bring in. And uh, I think there was a view that the sky was going to fall down when we broke away from the use of um, the names of women, uh, mythological women, in, as the names of our ships. And we moved into the actual um, using names of laureates and famous writers. And I suppose my argument at the time, and I remember putting it to the Navy and being almost on my own in the context of this, the sense of wisdom of it, um, was that a ship in a, an international environment, or any, wherever it operates, and uh, even off our coast, that's a shared international space, has to start applying its sovereignty from as early as possible. And I, I remember going into many ports on our, our ships and uh, the port authorities not being able to pronounce the name, not even able to understand where we'd come from. And whereas the actual use of the George Bernard Shaw or the Samuel Beckett or the William Butler Yeats created a capacity. And there was nowhere more than I saw this when we were in the Mediterranean, when you'd hear a radio call from a um, warship Samuel Beckett uh, over the radio that would go hundreds of miles. You know, a few people were asking, I wonder where that ship is from, because it actually clearly was linked. And I think in the context of the sovereignty side, the Samuel Beckett will be alongside in New York. You know, it will carry the Irish tricolour with the reflection of Irish sovereignty. But the name itself, before it even arrives, will be actually educating those that this must be the Irish ship coming because of the name. And likewise, it is, a, I think, a, a, a way in which you see how tradition a, can move along and actually you, you take, if you like, the importance of information and the way you use information as a way of leveraging the impact you want to make. Because sovereignty and the actual expression of sovereignty is about, in the context of maritime, is a, is a lot more than just the physical presence of the ship. It is the messaging that foreruns the ship. It is what's on the radio waves there. So in terms of Marian tradition with the importance of uh, communications and information, I think that's a good example of the two coming together. And by the way, the sky didn't fall down when we changed the names. And I think people have embraced the new shift. Now, I don't know if government will stay with the same line in the next ship, and it's a matter for government, but I think it was a wise decision. Well, I, I, I think I totally agree. And I think it's a good illustration that traditions, they're not set in stone. They need and must evolve. Yes. Yeah, under the influence of people like yourself. And um, another thing I wanted to ask you, I know that throughout the years of serving in the armed forces, you worked overseas in war conflict zones. Mm. And um, can you, if you can elaborate on 
what were those missions and what was your personal role in those missions and what is the role of the Irish Navy in general in the international mil military operations. You mentioned the one in the Mediterranean Sea, but it was more of the kind of, of humanitarian nature. Yes. But were they involved in military operations? Uh, well, well, part of the actual Operation Sophia was to actually look at other areas in terms of an illegal shipment of arms, uh, also illegal shipment of uh, hydrocarbons in terms of oil, and uh, that, that was a feature of that. In terms of my own uh, particular missions, they were primarily land-centric. I was in, in uh, Lebanon in 1990, and at that time uh, it was a very challenging environment, and you know, we have um, one of the, as a defence force, is probably the longest unbroken service in the Middle East, over 40 years serving in the, in the Middle East. We have over 60 years serving with the UN. Over 70,000 uh, men and women of our defence forces have served in some of the most challenging environments in the world. It's the longest unbroken record of any state in the world. And I think it's of particular significance as we move forward now for our bid for the seat on the Security Council, that a small country like ours can stand tall and actually reflect its support for the institutions of international peace keeping and international peacemaking, and actually have put forward some of the finest uh, soldiers, sailors and air crew that this country has produced into challenging environments. We have, as I said, seen hundreds of people die. We have seen many uh, bodies recovered and we've stood up to very violent extremists. We've rescued hostages, we've recovered bodies, we've recovered people, we've saved lives. And that's all part of Ireland's, I suppose, offering in, in the context of being a good actor in the international main. Uh, I also served in Afghanistan at a very challenging time in 2004. And I, I, I often think that you know, countries like Ireland can become the conscience of bigger actors. Uh, I was a partner with NATO at the time, and it was actually remarkable what Ireland could bring to bear in the context of looking at a broader play in the context of other institutions. And going back to my point on the importance of collaboration, one of the key areas I was involved in was building a network between the United Nations, between the International Security Assistance Force, which was led by NATO, between the coalition force, which was the UK and uh, the US, between the interim government arrangements that were there, between the non-governmental organisation, so that we actually had a sharing of information. I remember making the point, our endeavour here is to actually support the government of Afghanistan to have the democratic institutions institutionalised. Um, we, sh we can't afford to be hurting each other because of misuse of information or misinterpretation of information. And I, I remember once an example whereby a statement came out from the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs and it was about a mass grave being found at Kabul International Airport. And I remember rushing down to see the mass grave and actually it was a shallow grave with two bodies tragically in it. But it wasn't a mass grave. And at the very time we were trying to create the environment for legitimate elections, this misuse of information was actually destabilizing to the, 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 the citizens of uh, Afghanistan and that's the way we could actually shape the mess and, and the correction was there and, and that a shallow grave with two bodies was found and that was explained and that lowered then the temperature so that we actually as we led towards the actual elections which actually were successful at the time um, in terms of the outcome uh, we, we, we were working in lockstep together. Mark, you're a, you're a unique man in a way that, irrespective of your very high ranks and achievements uh, in your professional field, you still you never stop self-development. Yeah? And I know that a few years ago, and you mentioned this before, that you defended the PhD. So I wanted to ask you, um, can you elaborate on what was the PhD about and what was the motivation behind doing it? Well, I suppose, first of all, I am going to uh, abide by Einstein's philosophy. The more I've learned, the more humble I've become. Mm -hmm. Because actually, you know, there is a total uh, interdependency in terms of a, a role such as mine on, and the leadership side. I, remember, I think it was Mary Parker Follett said, you know, that leadership is not so much about the exercise of power, but about the capacity to create that sense of power in those who are led. The real role of a leader is to create more leaders. And I think in the context of my own uh, side, I was influenced by very powerful leaders who in their own space were um, 
trailblazers in the context of the areas and, and, and who gave the encouragement for me to go on a step further and to actually start developing that knowledge around uh, the maritime. Of course there was a, a selfish purpose in the context of for me to understand the environment I worked in. You know, drilling down and developing corpus and knowledge relating to the maritime was critically important and I've used it many times then and it actually it was through that research that in many ways my philosophy around collaboration, around information sharing, around networks, around innovation actually was refined and it was during that time in particular my understanding of the importance of diversity in terms of a system. I always say now since then is diversity is the hedge for complexity. So if we have an organization like the Defence Forces, we need to ensure that we're developing in a manner where it's diverse and inclusive. And that means that we actually improve gender balance, but it also means that we have a home here for different communities, whether it be culture, creed, um, ethnic, LGBT, sexual orientation. And, and I have driven around that trying to ensure that our Defence Forces is a safe place for different perspectives and a diverse place because it is that diversity that gives you strength in dealing with complexity and a complexity that is growing and growing every day. But in relation to the subject you mentioned before, like PhD was yeah. about corals, is it? Yes. Or was it about the law around corals? Was it about no, it, 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 Yeah, you know, it was overlaying um, two disciplines in terms of law and also the area of political science. And it, the, the question really was who owns biodiversity because through my early research in my masters, I, I, I did discover that the orange roughy uh, was being fished out and as a consequence corals were being destroyed. But I could not see anybody was taking corals into the calculation when it came to operations. And my question was, well, who, who owns corals? And you know, I concluded, you know, and they, they, so they, they, I concluded that we own them, by the way, the citizens of the state in which whose jurisdiction where they are. And so, what, and, and the, 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 I suppose the bridge I built was uh, from a sovereign right, to a property right. Now, those who are lawyers will say I'm bridging two codes of, of law, but for me it was quite simple that, you know, people understand property rights and so, uh, property rights that are not reinforced are more imagined than real. And that's the same for sovereign rights that are not upheld are more imagined than real. So if we have a sovereign right over a, an area of seabed, that translates into a property right over a resource that's there, and whether it be a fish or whether it be a piece of a vulnerable marine e ecosystem, you know, we must translate it into, a, into a, a code that we can understand the importance of investing in protecting that then if it is our property right as citizens of this state. And that was my conclusion. So, and that brings it back then into the political framework in terms of the appropriate policies to ensure the governance regime does just that and protects the property rights of citizens, which is in keeping with our constitution. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think for a few years um, you were in charge of a diving unit in the Navy. Is that right? No, I was never in charge of a diving unit. I was a part of the divers and I was privileged to be there. I re re recall back to even my early days uh, as a diver diving on the St. Beden, which was a, a merchant ship blown up by the IRA on the approaches uh, to Derry. And uh, that was one of the challenging operations and also in many other operations where we would have been divers often tragically looking for um, bodies and deceased people and also you know, the operational side in terms of uh, undertaking inspections of our hulls and that. So it is one of the key services that our, our defence forces and our naval service in particular deliver is a diving capacity in our maritime and we have some fine divers in, in the defence forces and we also work closely with our, our army special operations forces, uh, army ranger wing where we actually oversee the training of the Army Ranger Wing in terms of their diving, uh, in, in addition, uh, as operators. But the, the, the sign I see on your uniform, is it related to your diving activities? Yes, that's yeah? a, it's, it's a helmet with uh, two dolphins, and that's the badge that all our divers wear. Mine is a, a ship's diving officer's badge, but there is also a gold version, which is a marine clearance oh. diving officer. I was never uh, physically good enough or uh, able to, to acquire that, but I did acquire um, a search and rescue diving operation qualification, which meant that I trained, um, I am the only serving search and rescue diving officer in the uh, state where I, I trained to deploy from helicopters. And that was quite challenging, where you, you flew to a scene and you deployed directly with your gear, jumping out at um, between 20 and 30 feet with your gear oh. to actually for a rapid insertion, primarily on the area of uh, life saving and interception uh, operations. And as a diver, what would be your view on the underwater heritage um, of Ireland? We have a lot of shipwrecks in our yeah. waters. Have you 
did you dive to any of those shipwrecks? I have dived on, on, on some of them and uh, we have a duty of care too to actually in some cases some of these are, are uh, war graves they, they should not be disturbed and it's critically important that you know we, we have a respect some of these are actually dangerous too and, and some have not too far from here I actually have quite uh, challenging uh, explosives on board and it, we have to be careful that you know we have that knowledge to understand what we're, we're, we're um, dealing with as divers but um, I mean there are there are rules with regards to um, uh, the care and custody of such heritage and the responsibilities with regards to governance yeah Mark one of the last things I wanted to ask you what would you would you like to say something addressing the young people who are considering connecting their lives with the Irish Defence Forces well, I think um, I'm a wrinkly old admiral and I've had a remarkable career uh, in, in many domains at home, at sea and overseas. And it is just a remarkable institution, Oak Ignahirn. The Defence Forces are part of the bedrock of the sovereignty of the state. In fact, our Defence Forces were part of the key enablers that founded this, sta this state through the War of Independence. And we've stood for over 100 years in terms of providing the framework for what happens in the state. You know, people often say, what are defence forces for? for? But it's because of the defence forces that we have the institutions, I say, we have education, we have health, we have a safe environment where the vulnerable are protected, and we have an environment where commerce can go on. And that's the institutions of civil society, which um, our defence forces, who uh, I suppose are Biden by their values. And the critical piece in the defence forces is everybody who comes in will get an education to develop him. He will meet uh, men and women, friends who will be an esprit de corps that will be created here. And most importantly, we're, we institutionalize a, a culture, a culture by design, not by default, which is built on our values of moral courage and physical courage and respect and integrity, loyalty and selflessness. Most of all, we are you. We, we are the citizens of this state. We're citizens in uniform that actually through our selflessness and our loyalty to the state, we ensure that the state can function. So if anybody would feel that he wants to serve his state, there is no more remar remarkable career than the Defence Forces, whether it be in the Air Corps, whether it be in the Army or whether it be in the Naval Service. It is just a remarkable place. You don't have to stay forever. Uh, every junior enlisted ranks is developed to a level six. Senior non-commissioned officers get a degree and likewise all officers are developed to degree level and senior officers to master's level and, and I'm trying to drive also the issue of institutionalised learning from the point of view of the organisation moving towards becoming a knowledge institution whereby we increase the number of work-based learning PhDs and more or less as my own was acquired professional PhDs where people can develop right up to that level but at the same time giving a return of service to the state developing personally having great friends having a great opportunity to serve their country but also to be proud of a, your, your, your contribution to the state. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Thanks very much. Okay, Max, I'm looking forward to seeing this edited. <laughs>